Well, good morning, church, and good morning to those watching online as well. We are continuing on the straight and narrow highway to holiness as we examine the tabernacle. And I've mentioned in the past that the walk of holiness doesn't just involve separation from sin. It involves also devotion to God. And we see this walk demonstrated in the steps that the priest would have taken in the tabernacle as he moved through the gate. He moved through the courtyard, dealt with sin at the brazen altar, dealt with defilement at the bronze laver, and then moved into the holy place, which represented communion with God and service for God. So last week we examined the bronze laver. And what a vivid reminder that is of sanctification. We talked about how the laver was made from bronze mirrors. And we saw how we know the word of God is compared to a mirror as well. Now, if we want to look our best, and might I say, you all look very good this morning. You must have spent a lot of time in front of the mirror to look as good as you do. But we know, church, that sadly, there's a trap that a lot of unbelievers in particular fall into. They want to work from the outside in. In other words, many in our society are greatly concerned with their appearance, not so concerned with their spiritual condition. But I want you to note something. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the order. God works from the inside out. What does mankind want to do? We want to work from the outside in. We want to prioritize the external appearance and then people spend so much time on that, they have no time left for their inward spiritual condition. God works from the inside out. So if we want to have deeper fellowship with God, we must start where God starts. We must put in place that proper perspective, that order, beginning where he begins. And as we discussed last time, that means, therefore, that we have to spend a lot of time in front of the mirror, don't we, church? Now, when we talk about the cleansing water at the bronze laver in the tabernacle, Any Israelite was able to walk through the gate and go to the brazen altar to be able to make an offering for sin. But it was only a priest who was able to wash at the bronze laver. And as we saw in Exodus 30, a priest could not enter the holy place to serve God unless he had stopped at that bronze laver in order to wash the defilement from his hands and feet. In other words, church, he had to be cleansed for service. But not only did the priest need to be cleansed for service, he needed to be clothed for service. And church, that is where we begin today as we continue on the highway to holiness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We know it is truth and we know, as you say in the Psalms, the entrance to it giveth light. We know there is much darkness in our world. We thank you for the light of Jesus in our life. We pray, Lord, that that light will not be hidden in this church, but Lord, you would use us as reflectors of light in this darkened world. There are many people groping in the darkness, coming up with all sorts of methods, philosophies, schemes in order to save themselves from darkness, but we know there is only but one way, and that is through the light of life, the Lord Jesus. So, Father, we pray that you would illuminate our walk, and for this time we spend this morning, help us, Father, to understand these themes, and, Lord, may they not only be revelation, but also application in our walk of faith. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, church, if you have the word of God with you, I'd like you to take it and turn with me to Exodus chapter 28. We'll be reading only four verses to begin with. Exodus 
Exodus 28, this introduces the garments for the priesthood. As I said, they had to not only be cleansed for service, but also clothed for service. Exodus 28, verse 1. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments with which they shall make, a, brace, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest. Well, church, let's focus on verse 2 for a moment. The garments were holy because they were to be worn when serving a holy God. They were for glory because they exalted the priestly office in the eyes of the people, therefore inspiring reverence for God's called and anointed servant. And they were for beauty because, as we discussed in an earlier series, the tabernacle itself, on all the material that was used in it, would have been beautiful to the eyes. So the garments had harmonised with the colours in and around the tabernacle. So in other words, the look of the priest was to match the function of his ministry as he served God in the beauty of holiness. You see, church, the priest was accepted before God because he was called by God and clothed with the garments that God pr provided in his grace. But before we trace the history of garments, we find ourselves going back to the time of Adam and Eve. We know in Genesis 3.21, the word says also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So what we see here is that God had them remove their flimsy man-made coverings. And he provided clothes that were acceptable, garments. And this is an important point. Man didn't figure out that animal skins were better than fig leaves. This was God's plan. This was God's provision in God's grace, proving that God's way is always better than man's way. But what the Proverbs say, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its, the end, but its end is the way of death. Now, when we think about the garments we used to wear as unbelievers, we are fully aware that because of our sin, our garments were as filthy rags. So similar to what was said last week in relation to being cleansed for service, we must also be clothed for service. And I made the point about the clothing of the priest matching the function of his ministry. And the same is true for us. We cannot serve a holy God in filthy rags. And so many times in the scripture, washing the body and changing the clothes symbolize the new commitment and a new beginning with the Lord. I'll give you two examples. Genesis 35, 2. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. We also have the example of David when he was in mourning. 2 Samuel 12, 20. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. So in terms of our new beginning with the Lord, we know that at the time of salvation, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And even though we don't physically change clothes, we know that there must still be a parallel of putting off the old and putting on the new. 
Can I show you in the scriptures this parallel? Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. And we'll read down to verse 14. And keep in mind the parallel, putting off the old garments and putting on the new in relation to a new beginning with the Lord. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who was renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the, which is the bond of perfection. But friends, although we rejoice that our clothes have been changed at the point of salvation and we have started a new beginning with the Lord, it's not his desire that that is where we stop. Because as we discussed last time, he wants to, us to progress in our walk of faith. Why? So that we can build a deeper fellowship with him. So that we can lead holy lives as he has commanded. I'll give the example of Samuel. Even as a child, Samuel was given his own tunic, which was a garment normally reserved for a priest. 1 Samuel 2.18 says this, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. But know what the next verse says. It says, Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Now, on the face of it, this seems pretty practical. A growing boy is going to need new garments each year. But keep in mind the spiritual application. Samuel was growing spiritually and the provision of new garments constantly affirmed he was growing closer and closer and closer to the Lord each year. And that's confirmed to us in verse 26 of that chapter. It says, And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favour both with the Lord and men. Now that passage may sound very familiar, and it is. Luke 2.52 And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and men. Sometimes it's hard for us to grasp, but we've got to keep in mind the hypostatic union. That Christ was fully God and fully man. So this speaks of his humanity, speaks of a balanced person who does not neglect any area of their life and passes through a natural but perfect physical and spiritual development. Therefore, describing somebody in this way as they grow physically means they're also growing intellectually, they're growing socially, they're growing spiritually. In fact, what the passages in Samuel and Luke tell us is that by growing in favour with God and man, it tells us, therefore, that spiritual growth heads in two directions, upwards and outwards. Upwards to God, because we know the command, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But it goes outwards because we know of that command, you shall love your neighbour, as yourself. So this is the mark of a balanced person who has clothed themselves with garments dedicated to obeying the commands of God and walking in holiness. 
But the scriptures don't only speak of people wearing garments. In Isaiah 52, we see reference to Jerusalem putting on beautiful garments. And so the prophet here spoke of the ruined city at the time of Jerusalem, referring to her as a mother in a drunken stupor with no children around to help her. But God wasn't finished. He was going to bring a remnant back from Babylon. And as it were, they would give the city new hope and a new beginning. In Isaiah 52 verse 1, it says, Awake! Awake! Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. The command was simple. Wake up and dress up. But she must not just come out of her stupor. Clothe herself in glorious garments, which represented a new beginning with the Lord. You know, friends, the modern church could do with a similar message, couldn't it? Come out of your spiritual stupor. Put on new garments. Commit yourselves once again. Consecrate yourselves. That is what God wants from his people. But so far as Israel is concerned, even though we rejoice that there was a remnant that came back from Babylon, greater work is yet to be done when God delivers his people from the darkest time in human history. Then the redeemed of the Lord in the millennial reign of Christ may together celebrate the words of Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Well, church, we return to the tabernacle and after the priest was called, consecrated, cleansed and clothed, he could now in enter into service for God in the holy place. And as he walked through the tabernacle curtain, he walked into a room where there were three articles. Would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 25? And we will read of the one which we'll spend the remainder of our time examining this morning. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 31. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that came, come out of the lampstand, on the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Well, church, because of the design of the tabernacle, there was no natural light from the outside. So the golden lampstand was the only source of light available in the holy place. And so without it, the priests could not have carried on their various ministries. And this is a very important point when it comes to our service for God. It cannot be done without light. And so what is the light that we rely on for our spiritual service? 
Let me read some passages for you. I won't have you turn there, but if you'd like to make a note of them for future study. Psalm 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 119 verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119 verse 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Luke 1, 78 to 79. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness, and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Luke 2, 29 to 32. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And we consider, church, that wonderful moment when we are in the Lord's kingdom. In Revelation 21, 23 to 24, this speaks of our glorious future in the new Jerusalem. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honour into it. I can name at least three songs from all of those passages, aren't they? What a wonderful truth that we walk in the light. But as we know, in this age, there's a lot of darkness out there. So what's happened? Man has decided that they need to bring their own light. So they bring a counterfeit light. We know that a lot of this is connected with the New Age movement. That is a counterfeit light. False religion is a counterfeit light. A cult is a counterfeit light. All designed by men to counter the darkness, but they have no power because it's a counterfeit. We also know that in 2 Corinthians 11.4, we know there is one being also who transforms himself into an angel of light. But we know, church, there is only one true source of light. John 1, 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Well, church, we know that light is important in a spiritual sense, in a material sense as well. It's important to our material world because we can achieve many things from sun up to sundown. We wouldn't be able to work if we didn't have light. We wouldn't be able to study if we didn't have light. Now, God's material creation began with light. We know that from the book of Genesis. But so do, does his spiritual creation when we become a new creature in Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul compares conversion to creation in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He writes, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So it's obvious from scripture that the golden lampstand 
typified Christ who was going to bring light into the darkness and illuminate our walk of faith with God so that we may be, may be able to serve God. After all, what's the purpose of light? In the material and spiritual work of God, he created light not so that we may remain idle in it, but that we may walk in it. Psalm 89, verse 15. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Notice the totality in that passage. Not that you were once in darkness. You were once darkness. All of you. Darkness. But now, light. All of you. Light. Transformed because of the life that Jesus gives us. But church, here is the challenge for us. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 27. Exodus chapter 27, and this talks about the care of the lampstand. Exodus 27 verse 20. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony. Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. The priest needed to tend to the light so that the light shone brightly. Why? So that he, he was able to attend obediently to the work that God had called him to do. He needed light in order to undertake his service obediently and effectively. So every day the priest had to remove the dead material from the wick. Dead material which might have prevented the light from shining brightly. Now so that you can fully understand what I'm about to tell you, Let's take note that oil was used in order to keep the lamp burning. And here we know that oil represents the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is the oil and we know that Jesus is the light, who do you think the wick is? We are the wick. And if you've ever noticed a brightly shining candle, did you know that you cannot see the wick? Only the light is seen in a brightly shining candle. But if the light is not shining brightly, guess what? The problem isn't the flame. The problem isn't the oil, because we know in Exodus 27 it was pure oil. If the light is not shining brightly, guess what? Guess where the problem lies? The wick. So, the wick has to be trimmed. Why? So that it can be filled with the oil so the light can shine brightly. Jesus is, in the book of Hebrews, the great high priest. So the great high priest must trim the wick regularly by purging the deadness of our old life, our old behaviours, our old thoughts. Because in those, the work of the Holy Spirit is often quenched. So he has to come along and he has to trim the wick. Now, that can be painful, can't it, church? 
Because trimming the wick often means trials have to come into our life through that trimming process. Now, when we're going through intense trials, we might think that the light of our life has grown dim. But what we know is happening, church, is that the high priest is actually just removing that part of the wick that is stopping the flow of oil. And in doing so, it ensures that once the trial is over, the light may shine brightly once again. Now, because there were no windows into the tabernacle and later the temple, the light in the holy place, it was hidden from the world. Only the priest had the privilege of ministering amongst and enjoying the light of the lampstand. And so it is with the Christian. As a believer priest, we have the privilege of having Christ as the light of our life. But rather than keeping the light hidden from the world, God uses us as a reflector of Christ's light to a lost and dying world. We know the famous passage from Matthew 5, 14 to 16. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, if I went around the room and said, what's, what's your belief on what word we should focus on in that passage? I think a lot of people would say, let's focus on the word shine. But I'm going to give you another word to focus on in the context of what I just shared. The word I'd like you to focus on is let. What does let mean in the context of the golden lampstand? Let your light so shine. In other words, as we've been talking about, let God do his work in you. Allow the wick to be trimmed by the great high priest so that the oil may flow freely through the wick again, so that that light may burn even brighter. Do you recall how Jesus described John the Baptist? In John 5.35, he says that he was the burning and shining lamp. And remember I said earlier that if a candle is burning very brightly, the wick is not seen. Remember what John the Baptist said? He must increase, I must decrease. That should be our heart's desire as we walk in holiness. But if you desire to be a burning and shining lamp, take note of this. There can be no shining without the burning and there can be no burning without the oil. And this is the work of the triune God in our life. We must allow the great high priest to trim the wick so the Holy Spirit may flow freely through us in order to bring a brightly shining light to the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brief time and the lessons that we can learn from a simple candle. Oh Lord, this is a challenge to us. Sometimes we resist your work because we don't want to go through trials. We don't want to walk through difficulty. But we see, therefore, Lord, in the tabernacle service, the high priest, he had to trim the wick so that the light could shine brightly. Oh, Father God, we pray that you would help us to apply these lessons, that, Lord, we would be surrendered to your work so that we may glorify you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.